Professor Wills here. Well, we're starting a new subunit in our study of the ancient world, and we're going to transition out of Egypt and move up to the Mediterranean, specifically the Aegean, as we examine three civilizations associated with the Aegean. Now, these came long before the ancient Greeks, um, which is going to be our next unit. But uh, we need to stop off first on some of the islands where you can find these ancient civilizations. Um, specifically, we're going to focus on um, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. We've already um, met through our Canvas content pages, the, the uh, peoples of the Cyclades Islands and their very um, uh, mysterious sculptures in marble. Um, that have such a clean, geometric, modern aesthetic. We talked about how hot they are in, in the whole forgeries market. Um, but what we're going to see um, with the next two civilizations, um, a lot more sophistication um, and a totally contrasting vibe uh, between sort of the joyous um, lifestyle of the people who inhabited the island of Crete, the Minoans, um, and then later in some of our content pages, I'll talk about the Mycenaeans, a civilization based out of uh, the country we now call Greece um, that had more connections to the mainland, more threats from enemies, and perhaps they were participating in a little bit of the hostilities themselves. So without further ado, let's move on to our um, topic of the Aegean and specifically the Minoans. All right, my opening slide here is, of course, with a map, and I wanted to introduce, of course, this unit. We've already begun with the Cyclic, Cycladic people, and today we're going to get into the Minoan people through this mini video lecture. We're looking approximately at the years 3000 to 1200 BC. Here's a map uh, referencing the peninsula of Greece um, as we know it. Um, what we're going to do is, whereas the Cyclades Islands are peppered along um, the eastern side of Greece, we're going to move down south to this large uh, island here to meet the Minoans. All right, postcard view for you. Don't you wish we were all, we were all um, vacationing on the island of Crete? Actually, it looks a lot like Catalina, oh, the island off of California. Um, but the Crete is a large size island, but it's here where the Minoan civilization began. It's name taken from its legendary king, King Minos or King Minos. That's where the word Minoan came from. Um, and along with that um, is a lot of lore, um, legends, stories about his reign as a king, about this famous maze or labyrinth that was built under his palace where a monster that had the body of a human but the head of a bull roamed and had to be fed and appeased. That's the Minotaur, you might have heard of the Minotaur. Um, but part of all of the stories of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans became, become woven into the stories and legends that will get passed down through probably songs, oral traditions, and become a complete object of fascination for the later ancient Greeks, specifically Homer. So some of you may have had to take those literature classes and you may have read the Odyssey or the Iliad, those epic poems by Homer um, that talk about themes we've been talking about a lot, heroes, monsters, kings, wars, beautiful women. Uh, you may have heard of the Trojan War. When we get to the Mycenaeans, that's what they think uh, was the civilization involved in the Trojan War. You may have checked out Brad Pitt back in the day in the movie Troy if you want to see Hollywood's version of that uh, battle over the beautiful Helen of Troy. Here she is represented on um, some ancient um, Greek pottery um, and another Greek uh, artifact reflecting back on the Minotaur, the monster that was a whole object of fascination. So 
it's interesting, a lot of what we know about the Minoans and the Mycenaeans is because of this fascination, this love affair that the later ancient Greeks had for these early Aegean civilizations. All right, so we've talked about Cycladic art, and we are going to move on to Minoan art here. Let me make myself disappear for just a minute. Um, the Minoans were known to build beautiful palaces. We've talked about palaces um, when we were talking about our civilizations in, the, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt. But you, what you find, especially in Mesopotamia, is as these empires got bigger, they started to build walls around their palaces, right? They became citadels, like fortresses. And in that sense, um, this is what's different about the Minoans. They did not seem to have any concern with defense or protecting their palace. Um, and perhaps the location on the island of, of, of uh, Crete somehow protected them, insulated them like some kind of idyllic bubble from any kind of uh, threat. So, but we do know they were trading at the same time. So, in any event, it must have been an idea, at least an idyllic period, a peaceful time in history. And you can tell through the, the art and the subjects they chose to express through their artistic expression. But let's take a look at architecture first now that we're here looking at the palace at Knossos. They think Knossos um, is Europe's oldest city. Um, so that's what it's most known for. And as I mentioned, of course, Minoan is derived from the name of King Minos himself. We're looking at the years, uh, circa 1700 to 1400 BCE. Advancing my slide here, and I will pop back and talk to you. Hello again. This is an artist rendering of what they think the palace at Knossos might have looked like. Um, to me, it, um, it's so reminiscent of the Getty Center. If you've ever been to Los Angeles and went to the uh, one of the two wonderful Getty Museums, the one um, off 405 Freeway in Brentwood, um, not too far from UCLA, is the Getty Center. And uh, though it has a very modern aesthetic, um, it too was constructed of marble. And we've talked about the abundance of marble in the Aegean, so that will be the stone of choice. But um, what you also find is this very central access with an open air courtyard. And for the first time, we're seeing palaces or structures that are multi-storied. Um, here you can see there appears to be at least three or four different ele elevations. So that's something we've not seen yet. We've seen soaring heights and ceilings. I'm thinking of the temple at Karnak, that New Kingdom uh, temple. Um, associated with e Egyptian um, architectural history, but the Minoans are the ones who are creating this sort of, you know, um, multi-story concept. Still has a strong central access, more or less symmetrical. When you look at the plan of the place, though, here's where you can see how perhaps the ruins of this palace um, might have fueled this story of a maze, of a labyrinth inhabited by a monster. So looking at it, and again, disregard all of this detail here, but you can see that open air courtyard right here. On the left, these would be storage rooms, you know, storage for, you know, honey and grain, wine, that kind of thing, olives, all of the things that you would need to sustain the household of a palace. But look how much it looks like a maze or a labyrinth. Hmm, let's see how that story may have begun, unless you believe it actually happened. All right, um, moving on as well to our next slide. Um, here are some old timey, an old timey photo on the left of some of the excavations here. Now, what I'm showing you is a little bit of a cavity here because What's been recreated for um, people visiting the, the Knossos as tourists are the columns that would have been part of the architecture of the palace. Now, they were originally uh, carved from wood, long gone, uh, destroyed, eroded, 
um, termite eaten, whatever. Um, and so surprisingly, they did not use stone to create uh, the columns of Knossos and uh, they would have been wooden and they would have been painted originally. Um, some more scenes of tourists scrambling or, um, uh, among the remains of the palace. Here's a little closer view of those columns. One more for you. Same years apply here, but what I want to also point out to you is the aesthetic. Uh, fairly simple, right? We're not looking at very ornate capitals. They're not carved in, this, in a certain way. Um, though colorfully painted, you can see that they taper um, down at their bases. So characteristically, Minoan columns are more slender at their bases than at their tops. This is something um, that we didn't see in Egypt, just as a little throwback to the first known columns, these engaged columns um, at the necropolis of Sakra in Old King, from um, Old Kingdom Egypt, a thousand years earlier, right? Um, these are uniform um, in their uh, diameter, more or less, mimicking the stalks of the papyrus plant. And then maybe a century after the Knossos columns we talked about, um, the Hypostyle Hall at the Temple at Karnak, now Egyptian New Kingdom, um, these huge monumental um, beefy columns looking like squash cigars, right? Um, but that term entesis, the idea of it looking like a strained muscle, like a flexed muscle, um, as if you can see the physicality of the columns bearing the weight of the building. Um, not true at Knossos. So different civilizations, different approaches to column design. All right, some of the vessels found here is something we'll talk about um, in other content pages about the importance of the invention of the potter's wheel in the ceramics of the Aegean and particularly later with the ancient Greeks. Just wanted to give you a little preview of that. Um, and then also give you a little preview um, to our discussion of the incredible program of murals to be found um, at Knossos, making myself disappear here for just a minute. Um, but the one thing that's amazing is the passion for decoration, for connecting to uh, nature, um, flora and fauna, a little bit of Fantastic Beasts action with these um, griffin-like creatures. This is some kind of a throne room that you can find in the palace at Knossos. So they uh, were a civilization ruled by a king and a queen, so a monarchy. Um, this may have been the queen's reception room. What a great room, right? I'd be happy to work in there. Um, but it has this incredible mural of dolphins. So, you know, as we've seen over and over again in the ancient world, you find this combination of using bands or registers um, for figurative art, and then it's often boarded by abstract design. Um, passion for color, another characteristic of Minoan art, and a connection to nature. Of course, living on the island of Crete, they are surrounded by water, by sea life. They would be fishing those oceans. Um, and that is something that you see um, expressed in their arts as well. A little close up there of the charm of this particular um, mural of the dolphins we recognize the sea anemones, smaller fish, etc. So what you don't find in contrast to our other civilizations are themes of war, of, of asserting you know, a king's authority, statements of propaganda and power and authority, all of that that we've been seeing uh, for the past several lectures and content pages. Um, instead, we find instead joyful scenes, scenes connected to nature. And when you have themes involving humans, like this small original remnant, nicknamed La Parisienne, because this Minoan woman with her big curly pompadour hairstyle and big red lips looks like one of those 19th century Paris can-can nightclub dancers. Um, but it's an example of the wet fresco method used for their murals where they would let a initial coat of fresco dry and then a thinner coat um, would be painted upon and then together that thin coat and the paint would bind together, forming this very durable medium that's lasted all of these millennia. Uh, but typically you see the side view with a large eye, that's a very 
Minoan aesthetic. So be sure to move on to our next content pages because I want to introduce you to other murals like this fisherman and sporting boxers, but the most famous one of all is this one, the bull leaving fresco. So be sure to check that out on my content page.